Welcome, dear friends, to the season of the witch. That wonderful time of year when the veil of fog rolls in, we don our sweaters to watch the leaves turn to death and drop away. It is a time of calm before the winter storm. It is a time for horror. What better way to start off October's sinister cinematic spook extravaganza than with 1981's The Howling? Starring Dee Wallace Stone, Kevin McCarthy, Slim Pickens, a bunch of people you've never heard of, and the legendary Robert Picardo. Even schlock staple Dick Miller shows up to chew some scenery. Directed by Joe Dante, with a screenplay by John Sayles, The Howling is one of the most truly horrifying films I've ever seen. Definitely in my top three as far as effectively entertaining entries in the lycanthropic genre of cinematic adaptation. Much more sexually charged and fiercely provocative than anything that came before or that has been released since. The opening scene lets us inside the world of gonzo journalism as we follow newscaster Karen White through seedy back alleys to a meeting with the subject of a major news story, an interview with a potential serial murderer. The meeting is being tracked by her news crew, the police, and her husband, who also works for the station. Her team loses sight of her, and she gets a pre-planned phone booth call telling her where to go next. This film is all about atmosphere. The neon and circus-like lighting of the darkest parts of the city give off a phosphorescent afterglow, making our vision of Karen and her situation seem like a hazy dream. She meets with Eddie in a coin-operated peep show at the back of a porn video store. The lighting in this scene is pitch blackness with only her vulnerable face naked and exposed like a raw nerve. She feigns strength, but we can tell she's absolutely terrified as Eddie reveals himself behind her in the shadows and says that they have a lot to talk about. He makes her watch a few minutes of a gratuitous porn film, his hands gently pressing into her shoulders. He tells her about killing the others and that he's going to light up her whole body. The psychosexual drama is only penetrated by the fact that we as viewers know that something else is afoot. Suddenly, his voice takes on a supernatural, impossible growl. He breathes heavily and says with the cadence of something not of this earth, Turn around, Karen. As she turns, the expression on her face is one of confounded disbelief and absolute horror. She tries to scream, but can't. We don't see what she sees, but we know it's something too truly horrific and unreal to comprehend. The police are alerted to the ruckus and shoot Eddie, apparently killing him. We don't ever actually see Eddie. And that's the film in a nutshell. The way this film plays with the concept of psychological horror is breathtaking. This is the true concept and craft of horror, or rather terror, fully realized. We're shown the psychological aftermath of the attack, but none of the actual violence. It's really that psychological underpinning and Dee Wallace's performance that holds the film together. Her traumatic flashbacks and how they've damaged her relationships to everyone and everything around her permeate the plot like a fog. She's unable to focus on work, unable to accept sexual advances from her husband, and has blocked off a part of her memory from the actual events of her encounter. Her psychologist recommends a weekend at his retreat, The Colony. A place to rest and recoup, but the colony is not what it at first appears to be. There are some great characterizations here, and Joe Dante squeezes a ton of pathos out of every character. Patrick McNee and Karen Black are dripping subversive substance, and their abrupt but not unexpected turns are both curiously charming and brutally satisfying. Everything about this film is a nightmare fairy tale come to life, with state-of-the-art special effects by Rob Bottin. It is a brother's grim fable in the most diabolically sensate definition. It has the atmosphere of a Lovecraft story and the shattered worldview of 1980's paranoia of the unknown. It is not a monster movie, except that it is. It is a truly chilling tale grounded in the prospect of possible, if wholly improbable, reality, which doesn't lend itself easily to many of the most easily debunked Hollywood horror tropes. Even the title suggests that the author both knows what's going on, but is too shy or careful to reveal the contents of the glowing golden briefcase. This is a film that easily withstands the test of time, as both an artistic achievement 
and as a cautionary campfire tale about the evils that dwell in the darkest parts of the human heart, but rarely see the light of day, and are even more rarely spoken of. I recommend viewing it with a glass of blood-red wine, a steak cooked rare, and a modicum of interest in the basis for the macabre.